substance of the entire story was really what we just saw. Amen. We're going to talk today for f just a few minutes about the doors of resurrection life. Doors of resurrection life. It, it, when, if you think of a door, you, of course, you know a door is a place of entrance. It's a place of entering in. It can also be a place of keeping out. Can we? Yeah, thank you. I like that, that poster on the left. The resurrection, nailed it. <laughs> he just nailed it. Amen. Jesus just plain nailed it. I love that poster. But the doors of resurrection life, because doors are entrance points, they can keep, allow things in or c they can keep things out. And so we're going to talk about some of those doors. And our scripture. Uh, wow. Well, this is true. We can go off this. <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> Somebody's got to get this message. We've heard it three times now. <laughs> All right, God. Huh? Okay. Okay, so we're telling the, the resurrection story from the Gospel of John. And, and the Gospel of John up to John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. I, I didn't put it up there. But basically, it was the morning of the third day, the morning of, of the first day of the week, which is why we celebrate Easter and why we celebrate our services on Sunday as opposed to Saturday, which is the Jewish Sabbath. But it says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the, the stone rolled away. I'm just giving the backstory, And she ran and told Simon Peter and the other disciple, and the two disciples jetted and headed toward the tomb. And that's where we pick this up. It says the two, the two were running together, and the other disciple, who was the disciple, the apostle John, ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first and stooped in and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. You know, Peter, he's just going to make it happen. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. So, Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for Jesus. Just now make it spirit and life in our hearts. Amen. Today is the day, of course, that we celebrate more than any other day. This is the high holy day of the Christian calendar. Christmas is important. Christmas is, of course, we celebrate so much. But really, today is the day. Because today is the day in which Jesus Christ proved beyond a shadow of a doubt who he was and the validated everything that he said. Today, Christians around the world are celebrating this same holiday, this same day. It is his act on this day that sets us apart from all other religions, and that's not to diss any other religions, but the fact of the matter is, and if you don't know something, what do you do? You Google it. So if you Google it, I found out that Buddha is buried someplace in China. His body, I'm sorry, his body was cremated. Confucius was buried in Khufu, a, a, a province in China, part of a province in China. Mohammed is buried in the Mosque of the Prophet in Medina in Saudi Arabia. Abraham, the patriarchs of the Jewish religion, are buried in the Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron in Israel. Other religion, Rastafarianism, Sikhism, Taoism, Scientology, and all in all, on and on, all record the death of their founder and what happened to their remains. Only Christianity speaks of God's son coming to earth as a man, living a sinless life, dying a horrible death for you and me on the cross, but then having said it ahead of time, he said, if I come out of the ground, in three days, if I resurrect. Now, he said it ahead of time a number of times. 
if I come out of the ground and resurrect, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am exactly who I'm telling you I am. If I stay in the ground, then forget what I'm saying. So he made that bold statement ahead of time, a number of times to his apostles. And so we, that's what makes today so important in so many ways is that on this day, when Mary Magdalene showed up there initially and found the stone rolled away, they went into the tomb, the tomb was empty, then all of a sudden they started to realize, John the Apostle says, so the other had first come to the tomb, had also entered, and he saw and he believed. They did not believe, they could not believe what he was telling them. They had no experience. They could not understand how he could say, yeah, I'm going to just be suffered, I'm going to be killed by the chief priests and the Romans, I'm going to die, and in three days I'm going to come back to life. Couldn't, you know, if somebody said that to us, we would be like, yeah, right. And so, but on this day, the first day of the week, the disciple walked into that tomb and he believed. And so the first door, door speaking of entranceway, both physically and symbolic, symbolically, an entrance into, the first door that Jesus opened is the door of revelation. He opened the door of revelation basically saying, I am exactly who I said I am. The door of the empty tomb was the first door, the door of revelation, that all of a sudden everything he said for the three years of his ministry, every single thing was absolutely unequivocally true because he proved by the empty tomb, by the doorway of the empty tomb, that he was and is the son of the living God. Can somebody say amen? amen? Does that make sense? And so we're talking about that revelation, and he begins to reveal himself through the door of revelation to people, to you and to me, to the disciples first, but then to you and to me. And we can't understand, I don't know about you, but until revelation came into my heart, I could not get it, and I just, I had it in my head. I had, you know, some undergrad at Siena, some grad at SUNY Albany. I had s some stuff, but it was all up here, and it wasn't until one day that all of a sudden it traveled that 18 inches from my head to my heart, and I realized beyond a shadow of a doubt, yeah, he is who he said he is. And so revelation is key, and if you're trying to understand and you're like, you know, this is just a bunch of stuff, I'm, it doesn't make sense to me. The co correct way to, to, an to pray is to say, God, give me revelation, because a revelation comes by the Spirit. Does that make sense? So the first door is that door, that door of revelation that he has risen, that the tomb is empty. And all the other religions, and, and again, not to diss them, can't say that. That's what makes the difference. That's why there are over a billion Christians in the world today celebrating that very fact, that the tomb is empty. N next, Jesus now Mary is, is beside herself. Not only have, has she seen her beloved Jesus crucified and buried, but now she's coming to see him, to, to put spices on his body, just to weep, just, just, and now his body is gone. And so now she's just really besides herself. So not only is he dead, but now they've, she thinks they've stolen his body. That's how venomous and hateful the people were. And so the disciples, it says, I'm, I'm going to fill in the gaps here. The disciples went away kind of scratching their head. You know, in today's vernacular, in today's, it would be like, dude, what do you think about that? Psh, I don't know. 
That's, that's the essence of what that scripture says. They went away wondering what was going on. They had no clue. But the scripture says, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, now see, now comes revelation. She looked in the tomb and beheld two angels. It's interesting, the guys didn't see the angels, but the angels showed up for her. Supernatural stuff is, is unlocked by love. I'll just leave it at that. You can chew on that. She beheld two angels in white sitting in the tomb where the disciples were just like, dude, what's going on? I don't know. They go in and she looks and she beheld these angels sitting at the head and the foot of the empty place where Jesus was laid. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they've taken away my Lord. And I could just hear the heart cry, the grief of her heart. And I don't know where they have take him, taken him or laid him. And verse 14, when she had said this, she turned around and beheld Jesus standing there, but did not know it was him. And this is where we pick up the story. And Jesus said to her, so she's so overcome with grief, and her eyes are partially veiled by the grief. And she said, Woman, and Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus at that point called her Mary. And in that calling of her name came the revelation that it was he who was speaking. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And she immediately, and I'm filling in the gap here, she immediately grabbed a hold of him with every ounce of her strength. There was her Savior. There was her Lord. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father but go to my brethren, you go, Mary, to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. The next door of resurrection life that opened, first was Re revelation, the second door was the, the door of restored relationship. You see, it's always been about relationship. It's never been about a particular religion or stream and it's always about what God wants to do most in everybody's life is connect with in a one-on-one -on -one personal love relationship with you and with me so here in this count all of a sudden Mary is reconnected in love relationship with her Savior and her Lord and not only does that happen but Jesus now says he has re-established relationship with our Father who is in heaven. There is a reestablishment of that relationship. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ opened the door to that relationship. It be, it's started off to be a two-way relationship based in love. It got screwed up through Adam and Eve, and now Jesus, through his perfect love sacrifice, restored it. Next and you can see it, and you could put yourself in those places because that's the reality of what happened today. That's what happened today. He takes you, and he takes me, and he pulls us close to his chest, and he says, I love you. I want a relationship with you. I want it restored at a deeper place than we can possibly think in the natural. That's the Jesus of relationship, amen? And so the, the, the picture at the bottom is kind of hard to see, but it shows the hands of the Father, the hug of the Lord Jesus, and the resting of the Holy Spirit. When God restored the relationship, it was all of them, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all restored together. The risen Lord Jesus restored the relationship. Next The third door is the door of relocation. Now, what does that mean? I'm trying to get our words, so I had to stretch it a little bit. <laughs> but G uh, we had already read, but Jesus said again, 
I go to my go to my brethren Mary and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. You see, ultimately, we know that when we connect with God through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that our life on the planet gets better. However, the ultimate purpose of the of his sacrifice was not just for this planet. He had to open the door of relocation, meaning he had to open the doorway to heaven. His sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice on the cross, did that. He, it says in Revelation 1 and verse 17, when I saw him, meaning Jesus, this is John who was just with Jesus for three years, but now he's seeing him as the glorified Son of God. He said, when I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. He is the living one today, folks. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. He opened the door for us to go to heaven. Listen, even if this life absolutely stinks, it means nothing. The scripture says it's a breath compared to eternity. One breath <sighs> compared to eternity. I've heard we can't fathom what eternity looks like, but the example that I read a number of years ago is eternity is like one bird picking up one grain of sand off a beach, flying to the moon, depositing that grain of sand, flying back and grabbing another grain and doing that until he emptied all of the sand of the planet. And you're like, that's never going to happen. Exactly. That's eternity. And so as much as we focus on this life, and rightly so, know that ultimately that cross that we see, that cross was because God had in view eternity. He had your eternity and my eternity in mind, and he said, I need to open this door that was separated through Adam and Eve's sin, and I need to open that door so that they then have a path back to a restored relationship with me in heaven for all eternity. Jesus did that. Then next one. Huh? Through his sacrifice and his resurrection. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, it says in, if, if Jesus did not resurrect, then we have no hope. But the very fact that he came back to life means that he's the first fruits of those who were dead and are now alive. He proved forever that there is a life after death, and he opened the doorways to heaven. Thank God. Amen. So he, he dealt with the door of relocation. He opened those doors wide. The next door is the door of regeneration, and these are just, just little tidbits out of the scripture. Jesus came, this is a little bit later, the same day, okay, the disciples went back and said to the 12, the other, the rest of the 12, dudes, you won't believe this. The tomb is empty. We don't know what's going on. Can't understand it. John is saying in his heart, but John was timid. He's like, yeah, but I think he's alive. But the rest of them are like, I don't know. Now we're really perplexed. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes there in a locked room for fear of the Jews, it says, and he shows up in the locked room. And this is where we pick up the story. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, peace be unto you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. 
And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The fourth door, the next door is the door of regeneration. Because all the way up for the three years that they walked with him, even though he showed himself in many profound miracles, as we saw in the kid's story, there was no revelation of the reality that he was the false son of God. They said it, they kind of understood it, but not really. And now all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is resurrected. He's proven that everything he said was absolutely unequivocally true. And he shows them and he shows up in their locked room and he begins to show them that he is alive and he does things, and we don't have time to go into to prove that he was r real, he was material. His body had been changed, but he was not a ghost. And so he had them touch his hands. They had him touch his side. I'm sure after they got over the fear, they, pr they probably just hugged him and hugged him and hugged him. And so when they realized that he was, in fact, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, now they get the revelation. Now the relationship is being s restored. And Jesus now breathes on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They had had the Holy Spirit around them for those three years through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now the spirit of the living God comes inside of them and they are regenerated. Regenerated means made anew. At this point now, all kinds of wonder-filled things happen there because there's a part of us that spiritually is empty that is meant to be filled with the spirit of the living God. And the only way that that happens is when we have the revelation that Jesus Christ is, in fact, alive today. He's the Lord, and he wants to have a personal relationship with us. When we get that revelation, I can tell you, when I got that revelation, a bunch of years ago, at a very religious place, a full uh, quarry steakhouse, <laughs> at a full gospel businessmen's meeting, and all of a sudden, here comes a revelation, and my wife and her wacko girlfriends have been praying for me. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we're in this meeting, and this guy is speaking, and all of a sudden, my heart is going, pum, 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 because I knew that what he was saying was true, and it was directly to me. At that point, when I said, yes, I saw, the rigid, I saw Jesus Christ as alive today, I saw him and I wanted that relationship. I didn't say any pre-programmed prayer. I didn't know what, I don't even know what I said, to tell you the truth, other than said, I want to be like the rest of these people in this room because I knew they had something inside that I did not. They had a love, they had a joy, they had a peace. Their life was not perfect but they had something that I wanted. At that point, I received the Spirit of God came inside of me, and within 24 hours, stuff started to change in my life. The door of regeneration. It can only happen through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the sender of the Holy Spirit. If you can see him praying for that person and the dove coming down and settling, if we don't understand, it's primarily because the Holy Spirit has to reveal it to us. And so once that happens, we, things like this, it, we're, we're born of the Spirit. We're translated from the, the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. All of a sudden, spiritual things that made no sense, and I had undergrad stuff that in theology and things like that, made no sense. There's a bunch of stuff I studied to pass a test. Made no sense. Until the Spirit of God came and, and began to reveal that. 
Next. Same story. And so it was the evening on that first day of the week, and the disciples were shut up in the room for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst. Same story, same account. But consider the fact that they were absolutely terrified. Anybody here ever been terrified? It's not fun. But they were absolutely terrified. You see, they saw their leader cruelly and, and falsely accused and crucified. They saw the fact that, and they knew the fact that they had been identified with him for three years. They had stood with him for three years. All those times he, were t he was teaching, for those three years, the disciples were around. And in their heart, they knew that the Jews were going to come for them. And they were terrorized. They were absolutely terrorized. And so all of a sudden, now Jesus blows away that fear because he shows up in the midst of them. I can tell you that if there's fear stuff in your life, Jesus wants to come in and, and deal with that. He wants to blow it up for you. He wants to help you get rid of that fear, whatever that fear looks like. He is one who conquered when he conquered sin, death, and the grave, he conquered fear. And so he shows up, and he, by proving he's alive, and he begins to show that he, they don't have to worry because now he's with them. And because of the Spirit of God living inside of them, now he's, they have the same power. That resurrection life from him is still blowing open fear. Whatever that fear looks like in a person's life could be fear from punishment, from past ex mistakes. Could be fear of not being good enough. Anybody ever feel that? Could be fear of failure, fear of coming up short, you name it. But Jesus shows up with his unconditional love, and he absolutely said, let me blow up and take away that fear because I'm present with you and in you when you accept me. That's shouting stuff. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Thank you, God. He comes, when he shows up in a person's life, he brings all of the attributes of his nature. What's his nature look like? Love, joy, peace. Anybody use some love and joy and peace? Gentleness, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, the character and attributes of God he shows up with in our life. And he blows away that intimidation. The last door, or next to the last door, is the door of restoration. He begins to show up and he begins to re do the, uh, let me read it, sorry. When he had said this, he showed them both his hand and his side the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. He s restores destiny. He restores what God created us to be. Every single one, it says in Psalm 139, has a book. Your book, and you check it out, it's in Psalm 139, was written even before the foundation of the world. The book with the number of your days. In that book are assignments that we, were, we are to complete for the Lord. It's called destiny. Doesn't mean we have to go out, sell everything, and head to Mozambique, although we might do that. <laughs> it doesn't, it means doing, being obedient to whatever he's put on, in our heart and on our life. Amen? Could be just, a, not just, could be a good parent and raising your kids and doing the best job you know how. Could be any of a number of things. It's in your book. And yet, we can't complete what's in that book apart from having Jesus in our life. Can't do it. Because most of those things, although they're physical in nature, they're spiritual in power. And so when we begin 
to connect with the Lord Jesus, we begin to, uh, he says, let me now begin to restore your destiny. Restore the reason, the purpose for which I've created you to be. And he begins to take us, he, he grabs our hand one step at a time. He's not afraid if we fail. It doesn't get him nervous in the service. And he begins to say, let me just walk with you and let's fulfill this thing together. That's why at the beginning of service, I said there, there was just such a sense of so much destiny in this room. And he begins to not just show us, but empower us, activate us, energize us to do those very things he's called us to do. I love that we're, last night we're doing our Easter celebration at home, and my daughter-in-law, Alicia, was showing me a ceremony they do in Ecuador. What was the name of it? Do you know it in English? <laughs> It was a ceremony in Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what they did was they had people come in, priests, all dressed in black with things over their head, and they laid on the floor showing that the people were dead. They, they, they were dead spiritually. And then the archbishop comes in with a flag, a huge flag, and it's black with a red cross in the middle. And the black signified the death of the Lord Jesus, and the red cross signified his precious blood. And as the, as the archbishop walked in, he waved the flag. Oh, it was a, in, in the Catholic Church, in, in one of the cathedrals, I think. They began to wave the flag. And as he waved the flag over these monks, they would stand up and they would take off the black robes and they'd be dressed in pure white. That's the restoration of God. I'm telling you, when you connect and we connect with him, your sins, though as scarlet, it says, are as white as snow. Your past is in your past. Your junk is in the trash spiritually. And God is saying, I want to restore the years of stuff, let me stick my hand in your hand and let's walk this thing out because I'm a God of restoration. Amen? Amen. He begins to send them. Now, th there were some guys here. There was a tax collector. There were some fishermen. There were some other guys there with different occupations. But their destiny was to change the world. Amen. Their destiny was to take this good news of the kingdom all around the Mediterranean basin to India, to some of the Pakistan, some of the other places, and begin to just change the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. That destiny, they had no clue. Even Peter, at that point, Peter was like, you know what? Nothing much is happening. I don't know, there are a couple people in the room that are like that. That mean if nothing's happening, I'm going to go make something happen. I see, I see point poking somebody. So Peter's like, nothing's happening. I'm heading out fishing. Huh? And so if we don't know what to do, we go back to what we used to do. And, P and he, Peter's out there not catching any fish, which would be me. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up, and Jesus basically realigns his destiny. He says, if you love me, tend my sheep. If you love me, feed my lambs. And Peter immediately had his destiny, ching, and refocused on what he was supposed to be doing. That's the re restoration, the door of restoration through the Lord Jesus Christ. The last door, of course, is our door. It's the door of response. You see, Jesus did, and we covered all, all that, and there's so many more doors, so many more things that he did. 
on the cross and during this time. There's so much more, just just bunch uh, volumes and volumes. But God's word portrays, and it's kind of hard to see, but God God's word portrays our free will as our door. Our free will is our door. We can open that door or we can keep it shut. God's word show also shows that the same risen, living Lord Jesus Christ stands at the door of our free will. He, he's probably more patient than me. I'd be like, hello. But he stands there and he knocks. And he's knocking on the door of our free will. And he knocks on the door of our heart, which is where the center of our free will comes from. And he begins to knock at that door. And he's knocking, and he asks permission to come in. He's not a bully. He's not a pushy type, even though he's all-powerful. He will not ever override our sovereign free will. So he stands there, and he's knocking, and he's knocking. He's knocking on the door of our free will, asking permission to come in, asking permission to do all the six doors that we just studied a little bit, asking to do all of the relationship things and the restorations and the reconciliations, all those things that we think we have no hope of fixing. He's a great fixer. You know, he kind of shows up like this old house, but he's going to make it all brand new. <laughs> but in that showing up, he will not force the door open. And he asks if we would open that door, the door of revelation, if we would open the door to his re revelation, his relationships, his relocation. Do we want to make sure that we're set for heaven? Regeneration, do we want to be empowered by the Spirit of God? Do we want to remove fear, restored to that destiny? All of those things, he stands at the door and knocks. And really, at that point, it becomes our decision. By an act of my will, I can either open the door. For me, I did that over 25 years ago at Quarry Steakhouse of all places, probably because I like food. <laughs> but when I opened the door that one time, immediately my life went in a completely right direction. But I had no clue I was supposed to do this. I, I, was, I was teaching, I was tenured, and some of you know the story. I, I, was, te I was teaching for seven years at RCS Middle School I was head football coach. My goal was to become college, to full-time collegiate football coach. I mean, you know, the plan was there. And within 24 hours, God began to restore my real destiny. And it's been awesome. Hasn't always been easy because there are some things that have to happen along the way to fulfill your full destiny, but it's been awesome. And it's not done yet. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> right, Jesus? <laughs> said, your door's tomorrow. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> so so I, I encourage you, and we're going to pray a prayer, and we're going to pray a prayer that allows us to yield to the Spirit of God and invite him in. And you, you just, I'm just going to ask you to sit uh, if the team can come. But it really now becomes intimately personal between you and Jesus. Intimately personal. There's just no, there's no grandparents in God. Meaning there's no way to get into heaven by anybody else's bootstraps. It's got to be our dealings, our opening that free will door. So if we can just bow our hearts for a minute. I'm 
going to ask you to pray with me. And I'm going to ask you, you pray it in your heart. God still hears hearts. But if you pray it out loud, it's something that the angels hear. That sounds weird, but it's true. But to simply say this, Lord Jesus, I open the door. I open my free will door to you. Come into my life. I want to sup with you. I give you my life, all my junk, and all of my fear. I want my relocation to be in heaven. I declare you are alive. You are seated on the throne in heaven. And I ask you to come and be seated on the throne of my heart. Thank you, Jesus. But just stay in that place just and just let God begin to love on you. You love on him. We're seeing tremendous things when people just get quiet and listen. Let's stand together. one more maybe you opened the door a number of years ago but that door is kind of creaked shut over time over life stuff of life today is a good day on the day that is the high holy day of the Christian religion that we understand that Jesus did it all for you and for me to say that same thing, to say, Lord, I open the door fully to you. I don't want to open it just enough to get a little draft. I want to open it wide so you can fully come in. I'm not opening up the peephole. I'm opening up the entire door. In fact, God, I want it to be a garage door. 
I want it to be a barn door. I want it to be a big door to take me where you want me to go and do what I, you want me to do. Let's just take a minute. If that's you, just say, open the, I open my door wide, God. I open my free will wide to you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There are at least six people in this room who will go overseas for the Lord. At least six. There's probably more. But what I'm hearing in my spirit is at least six people, you have a calling on your life to go overseas. Maybe short term, maybe long term. That I don't know. But I'm telling you, there is a calling in this room for people to administrate ministries, to cause things to happen for the kingdom of God. In whatever mountain that is, what is a mountain? A mountain is an influence, an area of culture. It can be business, can be government, can be education, it can be family. It's not being in the church and working in the church. It's in wherever God has put in your book. But that's in your destiny book. Thank you, Lord. I'm just, for those who are maybe not so, I'm just speaking what I'm hearing the Holy Spirit say. And yes, it's okay to dream that big. And yes, it's okay to say, God, you're not done with me yet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, this has been wonder-filled. Amen. Amen. We ought to just give Jesus a big clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Be blessed. You're welcome to stay and linger and just soak and do business with God. We have some, some goodies out in the cafe. If you would like prayer for anything, maybe there's something here that you just want to solidify. You said, you know what, Pastor? This is the first day I've ever opened the door for Jesus. Can you pray with me to release my destiny? I'll, I'll pray. We'll pray for anything, any needs. I, but be blessed. Have a wonderful day. Amen, amen. Amen, amen.